I have with me a very well-known director uh, who's made films like Hasi to Fasi, uh, Haseen Dilruba. Uh, he's Vinil Mathur and he's also made 500 plus ad campaigns. Thanks for joining us, Vinil. Thanks, Neeta. Lovely meeting you. My first question. So, what's your first love? Advertising or Bollywood? Food. <laughs> but, uh, no, uh, um, any day advertising. I've uh, spent way too much time in advertising. Uh, so my best friends are in advertising, my best memories are in advertising um, and I love the whole process, the rush, the thrill of advertising so I think even uh, when I'm onto a feature and though I love making feature films I start kind of missing hard shots aching for uh, advertising and I think it's true for all ad filmmakers who want to do films it's always been the first love and I think for me it's still my primary love and you know, you work with very high profile uh, clients like Seven Up, uh, Mondelez, Amazon Prime. Uh, tell us about the top three campaigns that have uh, you know really worked for you and have been dream scripts. Okay, so I don't know if uh, I have had dream scripts, but I love the opportunity to make uh, like a dream film. Mm -hmm. um, the first most uh, I think uh, the film which I really you know when I look back I really enjoyed making and I think it did very well as well was the. Nescafe um, stand up, uh, yeah. uh, stammering stand up. Mm -hmm. I think uh, initially when the script came to me, it had a celebrity in it. So, mm -hmm. first, uh, and the client was great. Uh, Pratik from uh, Meccan at that time, uh, Bardwaj, uh, it was a great team. So, we ideated a lot and we changed the script to what the film eventually became. I think it had a right blend of uh, storytelling, uh, humor, emotion, and I think. Um, the, uh, the film did really well for the brand as well. So I think that's probably my, if I have to look back, uh, is one of my most favorite films. Mm -hmm. uh, the other film which uh, was great fun to win was uh, The Imperial Blue Men. Mm -hmm. Men. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, it was a film where this husband comes looking for a ring because mm -hmm. it's a strong anniversary and, uh, and the salesman kind of recommends a bigger diamond because, you know, but it's all looks and it's all discussing diamonds but mm -hmm. the the subliminal story was uh, you know not said but you could get it so i think uh, on a brand like imperial blue uh, uh, such great storytelling and i think we uh, came up with that ghazal uh, ajay Gilot wrote it and mm -hmm. uh, uh, amar uh, composed the, uh, the melody and uh, the, the ghazal's been a hit because they're still using the track i don't know 12 years later okay. so that's a film which i really enjoyed making as well um, and there's another film which I don't know if uh, people remember it. It's a much smaller film, but uh, one close to my heart because uh, this is for Vodafone. Uh, it was um, when Vodafone used to get SMSs with uh, you know life messages and stuff like that. So it was a campaign. I think Rajiv Rao at that time we we had written the campaign. It was a single shot film where his wife comes in. She comes in very angry and she comes in bangs her teacup on front of him while his husband is reading a paper mm -hmm. and then she keeps throwing a cushion at him in anger mm -hmm. and then he keeps giving it back mm -hmm. and then she keeps throwing it till she gets tired and then she sits down and, and then this you know you suggest that they can have a conversation so basically a calm mind can face mm -hmm. the you know uh, whatever storm so mm -hmm. uh, but that film was great because uh, no dialogue uh, single take and uh, Super performances, and we shot. And I think we had, we had shot a film with a lot of cuts. And mm -hmm. I think Rajiv came and said, Should we just try a single take? Okay. And I think we just did it in the last 10 minutes, and then that was the film. And um, uh, it's one of my closest. Like, uh, so it, I wouldn't say it was one of those big films which people would look back after years, but it's a film which is close to my heart. But then there are so many films, uh, it's tough to pick your favorite, but yeah, I mean, top of the mind, these are three films which I really. You know, and your production house, Breathless Films, completes uh, 10 years uh, this year. Uh, and you know, this is a business which is very dependent on creative agencies. You know, the recommendations that they give to the brands because you don't directly deal with the brands. And we've seen this trend of creative agencies coming up with their in-house production houses. So how does that really uh, change the equation in a way uh, with brands, agencies, overall, for you? I think fundamentally it's a little tricky on ethics because um, if an agency is uh, you know asking for a pitch from various production houses and and one of the uh, teams pitching is their own 
internal create, uh, production house, it becomes a little tricky because they have access to our treatment boards, mm -hmm. our ideas, and our budgets. So at the last minute, if you know uh, uh, they are able to kind of manipulate their budgets and treatments accordingly, and you know get the project, I think that's on a fundamental level ethically wrong. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, and I don't know if I can confidently say that people follow a uh, very objective due diligence on making sure that. Uh, the agency is not privy or the production of uh, uh, the agency is not privy to what we all send. So I think I do feel very uncomfortable about that firstly. Secondly, um, production houses are organized in a very efficient way. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because when we make a film, uh, our, our existence depends on how we deliver the film to the client. Uh, mm -hmm. It is not a business vertical for us. It's not a subset of what we otherwise do and it's not a cash cow or an ATM which kind of funds other things. This is what mm -hmm. we do for a living. Uh, if you make a bad film, we don't get repeat clients mm -hmm. and we lose out. So we give it all for every film we make because that's how we exist and we survive and we grow. So I think there is a ownership which independent production houses and directors get on a job which is very difficult when you get people on hire. Mm -hmm. Because the, I feel when agencies since they don't have any in-house production teams or in-house, sorry, they have the production teams, but they don't have in-house directors, they're always getting people from the market. Mm -hmm. So there are freelancers coming in. Not that they are not good or they can't win awards, but I feel that there's on a deeper level, there is no uh, cost for them or there's no there's no survival, uh, you know, the cost of survival for them because mm -hmm. they can do their job and then they can go out and they can do another job and you know they will charge their per day rates and stuff like that. But I, I think that's based on a commercial interaction. When we make a film, like I said, everything depends on the film. Plus, when we work with our partners, like whether it's a DOP or there is a stylist or there's a production designer or an editor, uh, we have years of friendship and equations with them, you know. Mm -hmm. And somehow, sometimes we are able to get the best talent to give their best to us because it's again not a day wise interaction, it's not a, a interaction based on. You know, a day shoot or what we paint them, it's more on friendship, it's on equations we share outside the shoot or what we build over the years. So I think uh, we as production houses are organized in the most efficient way to deliver the best possible uh, output to the client and, uh, and we are specialists mm -hmm. uh, and that's, uh, so I think uh, definitely uh, I don't think it's in the long term interest of the industry as such or for clients who kind of go to this one house has everything mm -hmm. inside it and we will supply uh, whatever is needed. I think there is no efficiencies uh, in scale they play. Yes, they might come with a lower cost, but uh, I think in the long term, uh, the passion, the kind of ownership what individual production houses bring, I think that's unmatched. If there is no it, accountability yeah, as well. Completely. Production house. Okay, and, and you know, there's another thing. Uh, earlier brands would devote a lot of their budgets to this one big film or you know, this one digital film also, sometimes TVC, sometimes DVC. Uh, but now it's, uh, it's become this era of influencers uh, you know, who, who are uh, all over the place and who are literally ensuring that you know, all brand campaigns are kind of coming to them in a smaller way. They are on Instagram, uh, short form video platforms, etc. So, and they, all they need is a mobile phone to shoot uh, whatever they want to say about the brand. Where does that really leave the production houses which have, you know, for, for a brand to go to a production house, is a massive budget involved. So, in terms of relevance, uh, how does that uh, affect the production houses today? I think there is a happy coexistence. I think there is probably a demand for both kinds of things. Um, but, like was mentioned earlier to you, uh, if you were to Let's say there's a great influencer who's making great videos and 20 brands come to her or him mm -hmm. and say make videos for us. Mm -hmm. After a certain point, uh, one of the brands might come up and say, how do I make myself distinct from the 19 others who are going to the same person and pretty much the influencer's voice is there in the, whole, you know, the videos he or she makes. So then they probably need to hire a writer. Mm -hmm. to write a better idea because it just can't survive on the charm or the antics of the influencer and such. They need a good idea to write, a good story or a concept for them. Mm -hmm. Then they say, okay, maybe I don't want the person's bedroom to be my background for my communication. I want them to be against a sea, a beach or you know, uh, on a road or whatever. And uh, uh, 
uh, so then they have to hire a location to go for a new land. And then they say, you know what, uh, it's, it's okay, it's, it's nice for this video, but I want my video to look good, I want it to have a certain production quality, mm -hmm. which is why you need to hire great DOP, great lighting, and you know, so the, uh, we serve different needs. Okay. Uh, when clients want something, uh, a film which resonates with their brand, with the profile of the brand, where they want to pitch it, uh, they want a great idea, uh, which is going beyond uh, what a simple individual can do for that two seconds. But yeah, it's a, there's a greater thought, there's a greater idea. And uh, like usually when we make films, there's a huge checklist of things the brand wants us to do, you know. Mm -hmm. Great consumption shots, uh, mm -hmm. great uh, product shots, uh, uh, great location, great faces or whatever, humor, storytelling. So there are so many things which uh, we, uh, when we make those traditional films, we bring to a film, you know. Right. Um, and also we give a certain guarantee that, look, this film, when we make it, it will come out in a certain way and this will work for you. And there is a strategy involved, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, normally when you are working on a brand, uh, and most brands which have long-term view, they want certain consistency in tone of voice, in the mm -hmm. which they have. You know, they can't mm -hmm. just have interesting stuff on one day mm -hmm. and another film is totally different. Mm -hmm. So they need to follow on certain kind of consistency in their you know, uh, communication. Mm -hmm. So which is where uh, you need professionals and you need a more, uh, uh, you know, uh, pro, what do you call it? seasoned people to come in and that would always cost money and budgets and you know, uh, so, yeah. And, uh, one last question, you know, as a fellow Malayali I have to ask you, uh, you know, we've seen a huge, a long, a big gap between both your films and I'm hoping and uh, that you know you're planning your next sometime soon. How soon are we going to see you make a debut in Malayalam cinema which is way ahead of its time? Okay? I think, um, I'm a bit of a fraud Malayali because I grew up in Kerala. I speak the language, not very fluently, but I have a inkling of the. Uh, I mean, I, I can speak, but mm -hmm. not to the extent that I would like to, and I can't read and write. So mm -hmm. I feel that uh, till I find a story which uh, uh, really where I can bring in justice and I can find the nuance, uh, because I still consider myself. Uh, that I would be an outsider to Kerala in that sense because I never lived there. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a story which resonates from where I am and the way I see it mm -hmm. uh, as a Malayali living outside Kerala, I think yes, I would love to make it. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to make a film just for the heck of making it because then I might be uh, using a lot of cliches and you know, or maybe have a superficial understanding of the environment because uh, I like for me it's important to kind of uh, find stories that are rooted in a certain kind of reality environment and I think just knowing Malayalam is not enough for me yet so I have mm -hmm. to work on the, uh, spending more time and scouting around for stories which would do justice to you know, the film so yeah till then I'm just happy watching great films being made in Malayalam. Super and we are happy watching your ads and hoping for the next big blockbuster to come. Thank you so much uh, Thank for being so to us Sunil. Lovely talking to you.